This is my first time at a center of excellence meeting, and you've got to love an organization and a meeting that puts the party before the main conference. It's fantastic. Not so good for the speakers, but, but great. Now, as I was putting together this talk, I was reflecting on some of the work we've been doing, and it was mostly experimental and empirical. And I thought that in every single case, we've used models to help clarify our insights. And I thought maybe that's actually the interesting story, and you'll be the judge of that. But we are, of course, a, a mostly a group of empiricists, mostly working in natural or social sciences, but mostly empirical. And I thought what I'd like to do is just highlight how you can use models to extend the scope of what you're doing. And maybe that might allow a few people to sort of reflect on what they do and consider whether this is something that might be an opportunity for you. Maybe it gives you an extra paper. Collaboration with a modeler might give you an extra thesis chapter or a backup thesis chapter if things go wrong. So that's what I'd like to try and do. And of course, it's important to remember that in every single node of the center, we have really good modelers. So there's plenty of opportunity to collaborate with people. OK. So why include some modeling? Well, I think, to me, one of the most important aspects is it really forces you to confront how much you really understand of the system. It's very confrontational and challenging. The second thing, and I'm going to give you some examples of this, is it can help sometimes resolve what might be conflicting results from a set of experiments. And then thirdly, it helps you synthesize and scale up what you're doing, maybe at a very small scale, to a larger scale, or over a longer time scale, and so on. So the first example I want to give is some work we've been doing on coral recruitment processes in Palau. And the question that we had here was, you know, what are the major drivers of coral recruitment? And we designed a set of experiments that were reductionist, typical kind of reductionist science. We broke recruitment down to its component processes, and we asked some questions. And we had to ask ourselves at the end, if we put our understanding from these individual experiments together into a model, does it explain what we've observed on the reef itself? In other words, is our holistic understanding correct? Because it might well not be. It might be that we missed a key process. Or maybe these processes that you can't study in a cumulative way all the time, you often study individual processes in isolation, maybe they don't combine in the way we think they do. And there could be some surprises in store for us. So we developed these experiments. I won't go into a lot of detail, in fact, very little detail. But we looked at processes of substrate colonization, settlement behavior of corals, uh, coral growth rates. We looked at the dynamics of other benthic organisms in the system, bryozoans and so forth. We looked at competitive interactions, the role of herbivores, the role of corallivores and sources of predation. And from all of this, we put together a model. And then we ran that model and compared it to the patterns of recruitment we saw on the reef. And just really take away from this, this is a size frequency distribution of corals for one type of habitat on the reef. And the two curves there are the model versus predicted. And in this case, it did a pretty good job of capturing what we saw. This is another habitat. It was the same thing. And so our tentative conclusion from that is that the insight we got from these experiments does seem to provide an explanation for what we see. It could still be the wrong explanation, but at least it seems to be consistent. I won't really get into a lot of detail other than to say we, we looked at the ontogenetic changes in the drivers acting upon corals as they try to recruit. And there's some very interesting uh, patterns that emerge from that, looking at ontogenetic escapes from predation risk, for example. We found that recruitment was greatest where herbivory and corallivory were high. That won't surprise a lot of people. And interestingly, most of this, one of the biggest bottlenecks when we manipulated herbivory, which goes to Jeremy's talk, was really awful survivorship of corals in crevices when herbivore access was reduced. So that was one example where the models actually helped us to sort of feel confident with what we were doing. And here's a contrary example. This is some work with Alyssa Marshall. She's doing her postdoc in Palau also. And some of this work stems from things she did at Heron Island. And the question we had here is when you go on a reef like this, you know, the dominant substrate here is algal turf. 
And algal turfs might only be half a millimeter high on a well-grazed reef, but this is the major food source that's driving many of these processes trophically. And what we wanted to know was, can we explain why you only have half a millimeter on a, on a good reef, and it maybe reaches five millimeters on a heavily fished or heavily nutrient-enriched reef? And once you do have very high levels of algal turf, they can trap sediments and really shut down coral recruitment. And so we did a bunch of experiments where we're putting video cameras out, looking at the grazing. We measured empirically the rates of algal growth on these reefs. So we looked at the bottom-up process in different habitats. We were comparing windward environments where there's lots of turbulent flow and the algae grow very quickly. And you contrast that with leeward environments where everything slows down. So that gave us a sort of bottom-up part of the model, and then we had to simulate the herbivory that was responsible for removing it. So we looked at there's various ways of, of representing that for all the major herbivores, and this particular experiment was done at Heron Island. And this is a model outcome from a windward reef. And so you've got time on the x-axis that's just at equilibrium, so you could ignore that. On the y-axis, it's algal turf biomass. The black line is the model average, and the gray area is the sort of standard deviation of what the model was doing. And the blue line is what we've observed. So in this case, the model's pretty close to what we observed in terms of the actual biomass of algal turfs on that reef. But when we looked at the leeward environment, we could not get these models to work. For some reason, we are underestimating the grazing or overestimating the productivity of that environment. And so what this means is that we then have to look again at our understanding and our assumptions and think, well, what are we missing here? I don't have the answer to that. It could be that there's roles of invertebrates we haven't considered. It could be that foraging efficiency is better than we'd thought in leeward, more sheltered environments. There's some evidence. But it helps us focus the next set of questions. The next example I'm going to give once this wakes up, oh no, I'm going to just say briefly a bit of so what about where we could say something in windward environments. If we look here at the increase in algal turf biomass, if it reaches this three millimeter threshold of turf canopy height, we have experimental data that shows this can interfere with coral recruitment. So let's simulate what different fishing would do. If we were to remove all of the fish, well, fairly rapidly you'd exceed that threshold of turf biomass. If you only fished everything greater than 10 centimeters in length, you would also achieve that. Uh, only everything above 15 centimeters, which is where fish traps are often highly selective, again, you see a problem. And if you only fished the largest fish, you would have the system that the biomass of algae wouldn't increase a great deal. So what this tells us is that removing the largest grazers in that system actually doesn't cause a very large response in algal turfs. And in fact, removing medium to large grazers has enough of an effect in these systems, we think, to really see a change in algal biomass that could be problematic. So it's, again, evidence that fishing down these food webs can have a negative effect. In another experiment on a similar question, this is some work that Bob Stanek and I were doing in Morea, and we implemented an experiment that we'd replicated in the Caribbean. And we were manipulating the access of herbivorous fish to the substrate. So we have a thing called a fish deterrent, which essentially pokes fish in the eye if they try and feed around it. Then you have a complete, almost, fish exclusion, which is the cage. And to summarize what we saw, if you look at the open to all fish treatment, so all fish sizes are represented there, you would have a treatment where you've removed the largest fish, which is what happens with a lot of fishing, and then a third treatment where you've removed almost all of the fish. If you look at the response of macroalgae, this is Morea, this is Lobophora, which is the primary alga there. In the open system, there was less than 1%. If you remove the larger fish, it increased to 5%. If you remove most of the fish, it increased further to 25%. If you look at coral settlement on tiles, coral settlement in the normal environment was good. It reduced sevenfold when you remove the big herbivores, and it reduced 15-fold when you had a caged treatment. So settlement really suffered, or recruitment, I should say, actually. This is recruitment measured after a, a year. It's the first year class of corals, when you had significant algae. Then you look at what was the fate of those corals that were already present in the system. 
So these are two-year-old corals now. These did okay in those treatments. When we removed most of the fish, they did really well because they weren't being fed upon. There was no, or much less, predation. So this means there's conflicting results of the experiment. On the one hand, you've got positive effects of fish that through grazing reduce algae. Reducing algae leads to greater recruitment success. So that's a benefit. The negative effect is that with greater fish access, there's an increase in predation, which is a negative effect on larger corals. So what's the net outcome? And to understand that, we created a simple model of the system, an individual-based model. And if we look at coral cover trajectories over time, what we find is that actually, yes, having the big fish in the system is a net benefit, that the beneficial effect at, at increasing the amount of recruitment outweighs the predation effect. But to me, the really interesting result was when we plotted a measure called macroalgal index, which is the volume of algae on the x-axis against coral recruitment on the tiles. And you can completely separate the results we got from the European study and our Pacific study. The same experimental design exactly. And what this tells us is that in both cases, as you add more algae, coral recruitment goes down. That's not a surprise. But in the Caribbean, you can still have fairly high levels of recruitment at relatively high levels of macroalgae. In the Pacific case, and this is Pocillopora, as soon as you have even small amounts of things like Lobophora, recruitment seems to shut down. It's as if that these Pacific corals, and Pocillopora isn't the most sensitive Pacific coral, are highly sensitive to algae. So although that these systems in the Pacific have demonstrably higher resilience, I think they have a potential Achilles heel. In that although it's unlikely, under normal circumstances, that they will encounter much macroalgae, they are not well prepared to cope with it. Maybe this is because they evolved in a more algal-depleted environment. The Caribbean is not an algal-rich environment, but some of the habitats are. Not the reefs, but some of the back reef habitats do have a lot of algae. Always have had. So we cannot be complacent, is what I'm saying. And then the final thing is about scaling up results. And this will hopefully resonate with people who do more physiological work. And this is something we wanted to look at on resilience and the dual effects of rising to sea temperature on coral. And the first effect we're all aware of is you reduce calcification rate. Corals have an optimal temperature. If you exceed that temperature, calcification rate goes down. If you model this for different Caribbean species, for example, with Parites asteroides, if you look at the current climate change projections over the rest of this century, you'd expect uh, calcification to go down, but also the extension rate or the growth rate of this coral. What is now called Orbicella annularis has a different strategy. Its calcification also declines, but it maintains its extension rate. It just gets a more porous skeleton. So there's two effects reducing, potentially reducing growth effect. The other, of course, is coral bleaching. So there's two effects of temperature. And what these do is potentially influence resilience. And those of you that think about resilience will be familiar with these sorts of graphs. Um, so on the y-axis, I'm looking at coral cover. On the x-axis, in this case, I've plotted the grazing potential or the proportion of reef that's maintained in a short turf state. And what happens, essentially, is if you've got a chronic stress, like a reduction in growth, that moves these sets of thresholds to the right. That means, in practice, that you would need more grazing fish to maintain this coral at a particular resilient level than if you had faster growing corals. Because the corals now have a competitive inferiority. It's even more inferior if you do that. Acute stress, like bleaching, has a very different effect. That produces a very rapid reduction down this y-axis. And the game that we're trying to play is how likely is it that reefs will stay in this region? Because in this region of the graph, they are what we call resilient. They have the ability to try and bounce back. The processes of recruitment and growth exceed those of mortality. And that's what we want to do. So to quantify resilience, we ask, what's the probability that by 2060, reefs would still be in that region under a certain set of stresses? And if you have a control scenario where there is no glo global warming, and this is plotting coral cover from an average 20% in the Caribbean into 2060, obviously things improve if there's no global warming, 
With acute stress only, they decline. With chronic stress on growth, they decline more slowly. Together, they combine, obviously, very negatively. If you look at the resilience story, so again, this is the probability that these reefs remain in that basin of attraction when they can keep bouncing back. Under acute stress, it declines over time. Chronic, the same. But take them together, a very rapid reduction in resilience. And if you look at this in terms of the explicit consideration of whether these are additive or synergistic effects, if they were merely additive, you would get that gray line. But they actually followed the blue line. So this is a true synergistic effect. So a very diverse set of examples, I guess. But the conclusions are, first of all, that medium to large herbivores have a very important impact on algal turfs. And that includes many of the surgeon fish. Large herbivores are, maybe only have a modest impact on macroalgae, in, in Marea at least, but it seems to be enough to have a strong impact on coral recovery. The dual effects of rising sea temperature act synergistically to reduce resilience. And so these disparate examples hopefully might convince one or two people that adding some modeling to your work can help you test your ideas try and focus on priority questions to move forward with and help resolve some of the potentially complex outcomes of your sets of experiments. And I'd just like to thank the people who really worked on this. This is Chris Doropoulos and Jez Roth, Alyssa Marshall, uh, Mehdi Ajarad and Bob Stenek, and Eve-Marie Bozek for the modeling. Thank you. <laughs>